This week on The Gadget Show, we celebrate the technology that breathes life into almost every gadget we use. Radio waves. We show the shocking results of exposing an unprotected computer to the internet. And I travel to Holland to test drive a wheel. The simplest technology is sometimes the most important technology. By tapping this 9 volt battery, I'm showing you what links guided missiles, space stations, mobile phones, microwave ovens, and television. It's radio, and radio rules the world. It's the most essential bit of technology in our lives, and yet most of us are totally unaware of what it does. Um, I'll listen to the radio, but I don't, I don't use radio. You don't, no. generally in your life, you don't use it? Not really, no. Roger. It, it is Roger, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, cheers. <laughs> I do use uh, microwaves, but only to warm like peas and carrots and stuff like that. But actually, those actually carrots, mate, those carrots are brought to you. Care of radio. Care of radio. Seriously, mate. Microwave. It's a radio, isn't it? Carrot radio, then, is it? It's, it's, it's carrot FM. <laughs> yeah, it's affirmative. Yeah, Roger. Have you ever gone on holiday? Um, I, from time to time. Aeroplanes, yeah. mate. GPS, radio, isn't it? Radio navigation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Radio navigation. You got a mobile phone? It's all about radios. I have indeed. Yeah. Little walkie-talkie, isn't it? Yes, yes. So you've got a little transceiver in your hand there, madam. Yeah, yeah. Big fan of radio, are we? Oh yeah, very much so. Yeah. So now I'm going to ask you the question again, without meaning to be rude. Do you use radio? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. You can go now. Thank you. <laughs> See you later. The fact is, radio is not just about sound. Radio waves can carry pictures and data as well. If you're watching me right now on satellite, it's radio waves that are carrying me through space and into your front room. And all those technologies we think of as totally cutting edge, like Bluetooth, 3G, GPS, Wi-Fi, however they're dressed up, whatever fancy names they've been given, underneath it all, they're just radio. So what are radio waves? Well, they're electromagnetic radiation, and they can pass right through you without disturbing any of your atoms. I can demonstrate the principle of radio with my basic transmitter, this battery and nail. As I open and close the circuit, the change in electricity flow creates an, a magnetic field. It's a little like when you drop a pebble in a calm pond. The magnetic field radiates out in waves, radio waves. If these waves hit an antenna and get amplified, we can hear them as static crackles. All you've got to do is start controlling these crackles and you get something understandable, a means of communication. In other words, Morse code. And that's just what Marconi did. In 1901, he succeeded in using radio to send the letter S across the Atlantic Ocean. Back then, that S was the only man-made radio signal floating around anywhere on Earth. Just over a hundred years later, and radio is everywhere. So, how do we select the radio waves we want out of the millions flying around us? Well, your receiver has a couple of clever bits inside. A tuner and a decoder. The tuner helps you decide which frequency of radio wave to listen to. And the decoder looks at that radio wave and decides whether to extract audio or video. I guess the best way to work out just how important radio is to us is to imagine what life would be like without it. Oops. Well, for a start off, we'd lose most of our gadgets, like telly, mobiles and microwaves. Even worse, there'd be no time. It's radio signals that keep the different time zones around the world in sync. There'd be no space exploration. No remote control toys. In fact, we may well have lost the Second World War. After all, it's widely accepted that without radar protecting this green and pleasant land, the Luftwaffe would have run amok. Cabs would have to write to their drivers. The police would have to go back to using whistles. I don't see anybody. The armed forces would be lost. 
the Navy would have to resort to semaphore to communicate between ships. The Air Force, they might as well be grounded. And how do you communicate with a tank without radio? Knock on the outside? I don't think so. And it doesn't look like radio will be going out of fashion anytime soon. Before long, barcodes will disappear from shops, replaced by the more intelligent RFIDs, or Radio Frequency Identification Tags, allowing your food to pretty much check itself out. And the new ambient technologies that allow a gentler, more human interface between us and our electronics will almost, without exception, rely on radio to communicate. They're even proposing using radio waves to propel spacecraft. So you see, radio really does rule the world. One of the biggest announcements in the gadget world over the last couple of months has been the introduction of the Motorola Rocker by Apple boss Steve Jobs. Already being dubbed the iPhone, because essentially it's both an iPod and a phone, it's fully compatible with iTunes software, holds a hundred songs and has built-in stereo speakers. Sony Ericsson also seem to think that we prefer to free up pocket space by combining our phones and MP3 players. They've created the first Walkman phone. Both the Walkman and the Rocker phones store their music on a flash memory card whereas Nokia's N-series music phone seems to be taking the job a lot more seriously. It contains a 4-gig hard drive that can store up to a thousand songs. That puts it in the same class as standalone MP3 players, such as Apple's new iPod Nano. But despite the iPod's continued domination of the MP3 market, there are now lots of other devices which include digital music players. Here's Tom Dunmore, editor-in-chief of Stuff magazine, with a few of his favourites. If you're one of the few people who hasn't bought an MP3 player yet, it might well be worth holding off, because it seems like just about every gadget in the pipeline has got a digital music player built in. Take this digital radio from Pure. Not only does this give you crystal clear radio from 30 or so stations, many of which you can't receive on, on FM or AM, but it also will play MP3s. More unexpected is the MP3 player built into these Oakley Thump sunglasses. The actual sides of the glasses hold 512 megabytes of memory, that's enough for about 10 hours of music. The problem is, the sides also hold these earphones and they're really hard to get into your ears. Everybody in the crew has tried these on and uh, nobody's really been able to get a good fit, which means the sound quality isn't as great as we'd like. But they are really, really fun, and my favourite feature about them is if you happen to be you know, walking down the high street listening to music and walk into a dark shop, you don't have to stop listening to your music. You can just flip up the shades. I mean, you're going to look fantastically cool walking around like this, aren't you? The device that will be used most for listening to music on the move in the next year or so will be the PSP. Now, you've no doubt seen the PSP before, but you might not know that as well as a gaming machine, it will also play movies and, crucially, music. It runs off memory sticks rather than hard drive. So you'll need to buy as big a capacity memory stick as possible. Sony are also integrating the PSP into their download service, Sony Connect, so that you'll be able to download music and movies specifically for this device. If you have still got an iPod, don't worry, there are still convergent music devices out there for you. How about converging your iPod with a jacket? Seriously, you see, we've visited Motorola to get this prototype jacket that they've been making in collaboration with the snowboard company Burton. And it's got this secret pocket that allows you to plug in an iPod. It's got a battery to charge it. It's got a control panel here so that I can press play. And there you go, we've got music coming out of these little speakers that are mounted right next to the head. That's not the jacket's only talent. It'll also link to your mobile phone by Bluetooth and if you get a call come in, it will stop the music and allow you to take a call while you're practicing your parallel turns.
An unfortunate side effect of our increasing use of computers and the internet is that everything we do seems to require a password. Online banking? New password, please. Email account? Likewise. Want to buy something? Then enter your details and choose a password. And that's on top of all the passwords you need for computers and email at work. These passwords are the front door key to everything. Our money, our credit card details, our little secrets, our company's future product development plans, whatever. But they're not a very secure key. For a start, it requires a monumental feat of mental gymnastics to remember them all. So we all come up with shortcuts like using the same ones or writing them down and hiding them. And people seem ready to surrender their passwords in return for the smallest of treats. Tell me what your passwords are in exchange for this box of chocolates. I use my nickname. So, so you won't tell me them at all? You've got to tell him. <laughs> tell him. <laughs> tell him. Yes, yeah, it's Ferrari. It's, it's uh, called Sp Spartacus. Spartacus. OK. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, that's fine. Dolly Dimple. <laughs> Dolly Dimple. That's lovely. Can I have the chocolate? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Creamy. Creamy. Lovely. Holly. Holly. If I do my bank form, you won't rob me, will you? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, bye-bye, Dolly Dimple. Naturally, the people working in the gadget show office wouldn't give up their passwords so easily. But that still doesn't mean they're safe. We asked three of our finest employees to think of a password each. We wanted to see whether it was easier to discover them by hacking into their minds or their computers. To achieve this, we brought in a hypnotist, Jonathan Royal, who tried to find out by hypnotising them all and top security expert Dave Duke, who would use his technical skills on their computers. First up, Karen. She knows we're trying to discover her secret password, but will she play hard to get? Mom, just close your eyes and just sleep, 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 sleep. John's going to ask you three questions. This will be the same question three times, namely, what is your password? The first two times that he asks you this question, you will blatantly lie. The third time, you'll find you've got an overwhelming desire to tell him, and you'll feel really, really good about it. Wakey, wakey, rise and shine. John? <laughs> Karen, what's your password? Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't believe that. Karen, what's your password? John. <laughs> I didn't believe that either. So, uh, let's try the third time. Karen, what's your password? Gadgets 8. Sleep. Relax deeper, 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 deeper. Wake your eyes and try. Karen was genuinely unaware that she'd revealed her correct password to us. But would our security expert find it out so easily? Karen, this is Dave. You just need to have a look at your computer for a second. You don't mind it. In fact, he was retrieving a device he'd fitted on the back of Karen's computer while she'd been away from her desk. Thank you. So tell me what exactly you put on Karen's computer. Well, this is a little digital device which actually records the keystrokes as people type them directly from the keyboard, as you, you can see. Yeah. And it can store 65,000 letters inside it. Uh, and you can put it in, leave it running for a month, a year, collect all the information that you need, pop back in, take it out, stick it back in your own system. Right, and, and then, very simply, by just running up yeah. a simple notepad program yeah. and typing in a secret word, you can now see that it's actually displaying. This was a, a password. Gadgets eight. Gadgets eight. Log, logging onto right, a system. So that's our... This is the website that she went to buy something from. Ooh. This was a login name for that for her credit card details. This was her password, and that's her credit card number. So we've got two lots of passwords and her credit card number. Just yeah. off this thing that costs how much? Fifty dollars. Worrying stuff. But now it was Jess's turn. Our hypnotist had asked her to write out her real password as well as four incorrect ones. And he hoped to discover which was the real one now, by studying her body language. OK, wakey, wakey, rise and shine. Have you got that list you made earlier? I have, yes. yes. Right, I'm just going to ask you in turn, is this your password? And for each one, I want you to say yes. Now, that means you'll be lying four times and once you're going to be telling the truth. Jess, is your password Jessica1? Yes. Is your password Gadget Show? Yep. Is your password Jessie's Wicked? Yep. Is your password North One TV? Yes. Is your password Television One? Yes. So we're going to gamble on this, but off body language, I would opt for that. that. One there. Okay. Which is Jesse's Wicked. Is Thanks. 
<laughs> Thanks. But no. <laughs> but no. <laughs> what was it? Oh, it was the there. last one. It was the last one. Television one. Mm. Well, that just goes to prove how good a liar you are. <laughs> <laughs> so Jess has resisted hypnosis, but can she protect her password from our technology expert? Next, we're going to see how vulnerable Jess's password would be to a dictionary attack. That's where hackers try and crack into a computer system using a special program that contains a massive number of passwords that are tried very quickly, one after the other. Right, Dave, what do we need to do? OK, what we're going to do is we're going to put a password into this tool and it's going to check, using a hacking technique, how quick it's going to take to break. So, just type your password in. Press the check password button. Cracked it. Less than a second, the hacker would have got that password and have been into your system. What would we need to do to make it more secure? You need to really add random letters and, and numbers and other information into it so that your password isn't a real word, so that people can't use a dictionary, troll the passwords and, and find out what it is. And if we do that with this password... Mm, let's try a new one. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. A hacker wouldn't have been able to use a dictionary attack on that. So just a few seconds extra thought on your password and makes it much more difficult. Indeed. With Jess now in possession of a more secure computer, it's time to see if James can protect his password. James proved resistant to hypnosis, so Jonathan was forced to try another technique. He asked James to write out his password and then set fire to it in front of me. Now he'll attempt to guess it by studying James typing it out on an imaginary keyboard. This is what I got. I got P-A-P-E-R-C-L number zero P. I've got paper clock. Now, are we anywhere near? You are 80% right. One letter's wrong and you're one character missing. In fact, Jonathan had used a trick. By writing out his password, James had made it vulnerable to Jonathan's sleight of hand, despite it appearing to be destroyed. Right, let's try the technological approach. We're going to access James's PC remotely. Using widely available software, we're going to hack into his computer and get an exact copy of his computer screen on ours. And we're also going to log all his keystrokes. And our computer expert could do this from anywhere in the world. So, James, type in the password, please. OK, so we'll have a look here. Keystrokes. And we can see he's typed paperclip. This little symbol means a shift key and one. So shift one, which is exclamation mark, so his password's paperclip, exclamation mark. Paperclip, exclamation mark. Yep, that's it. Hmm, what else can you do? Right, what we can also do is we can actually go and have a look in real time at his system. This is exactly what he's doing second by second. Right. So we can see at the moment he's browsing a website, uh, pointing his cursor. But on top of that, we can actually go and take information directly from his system. So here, we're actually looking at his webcam. We've taken a photograph of him, sat at his desk. We've got evidence that this is him at his desk, this is the website that he was actually looking at at the time, and we know exactly what he was typing. The results prove that while some of our team may be able to resist hypnosis, their passwords and much more besides would all be vulnerable to a serious computer hacker. But what can you do to protect yourself? Well, here's our guide to choosing a better password. First, don't choose anything too obvious. Surveys suggest that the most popular passwords in Britain are Manchester United, followed by Britney Spears and Admin. If you choose one of those, you'll be in danger. Remember not to use dictionary words, and if you do, throw an odd character like an at sign or a hash key into the middle to make them safer. You can also throw a number into the middle as well, which will make it safer still, though rather harder to remember. And if you must use the same password for many things, make sure you have a different one when you need a high level of security. But passwords could soon be a thing of the past anyway. There are much better alternatives, like those where you choose pictures or pick points on an image. My favourite is this one called Passfaces. It uses something the human brain is particularly good at, recognising and memorising faces. You're assigned a series of faces and you log on by clicking on the face you recognise from a series of screens. You can try it out on the company's website. I was assigned my faces a few months ago and I never fail to pick them out every time, even when I haven't used them for weeks. Try that with your office password after you've been on holiday. 
the faces are chosen for you. If we're allowed to choose, apparently we end up going for people like ourselves but prettier, which makes them more easily guessed by crackers. And allowing us to choose friends or family members would be a real giveaway. All the faces, incidentally, belong to students who've been paid a few quid for this peculiar form of fame. I'd much prefer this system to passwords. I have to have my own office password reset so often they might as well leave it at admin. And these charming faces would be a much better start to the day anyway. The first thing I ever shot for the gadget show was this rather ramshackle race. We were testing a whole range of personal transport gadgets, none of them allowed on the public road, but all great fun. There was this ridiculous Australian-built airboard. Oh, dear. I'm stuck. A big silver flymo driven along very slowly by a pair of circular brushes. There was the wheelman, basically a miniaturised motorbike you ride like a skateboard. Looks good, but it's incredibly hard to master. We tried the Oso Camp Segway, balanced perfectly by gyros. It's amazingly clever, but riding one does make you look amazingly silly. My personal favourite was the petrol go-ped, basically because it was the fastest. It went off-road and I rode it to victory in our wacky race. But that was over a year ago. Now there's a new gaggle of gadgets to ride around on. When Jason visited Nextfest in Chicago, he got this exclusive footage of the next generation Segway. This is the prototype of the off-road Segway. Basically, you ride around in an upright position on two wheels until you come to a bit of rough stuff, then drop down effortlessly onto four wheels. Neat, eh? This is the trike. It may look like a micro-scooter that's been cleft with an axe, but this layout, combined with some clever joints, means you can power yourself along by shifting your weight. This may look pretty simple, but it takes quite a lot of effort. You've really got to push and lean into it to get some motion. Now the problem is when you first start to have a go, you think about everything and you can't get any speed or any motion. It's actually better if you're on the balls of your feet so you can really push and lean in. It's like dancing a bit. See how the experts make it look so easy. But I've been having a go on this for about 15 minutes and I can already feel my arms starting to ache, but it's great fun. The movement you make to power yourself on the trike is very much like snow skiing, which makes it totally unsurprising that you can also get one with skis on. This is a KMX, a karting motocross. I think of it as a sort of BMX with three wheels and you pretty much get in there. It's pretty sensitive, it's very reactive, which makes it much more fun. Handles really well, it's quite responsive, which makes it whoop, quite good fun. Whoop. Woo. So there's plenty of choice out there whether you want your personal transport with four, three or two wheels. Yeah. <laughs> but what about one? Just one wheel with an engine. It's something that inventors have been trying to perfect for a very long time. This lady was one of the first to try with her Dynosphere back in 1932. Gravity itself is our motive power and pulls us along. Just a year later, the French were at it with the motor wheel. By the 1960s, the Americans had decided it was their turn to reinvent the wheel, and a bunch of university types created this. The wheel travels on any reasonable ground, and the test proved that all the problems of balance have been solved. To steer it, the new style motorist leans well over, the wheel answering perfectly. It may have a future as a car, able to go nearly anywhere. No room for a backseat driver. 
And so to the next attempt. We've come to Eindhoven in Holland and I'm about to test drive the wheel surf. And this is it, being ridden by the man hoping to sell it around the world, Herman Hinson. It's made up of an inner and outer frame. The inner frame is where the rider sits and it also holds the two-stroke 56cc engine and petrol tank. The outer frame is the wheel and the only contacts between the two frames are three small drive discs. Because the inner frame has a low, heavy centre of gravity, as the outer frame turns and rolls forward, the inner frame stays pretty much upright. Watching Herman ride around on it, I wasn't exactly filled with confidence. Even in his hands, it looked very unsteady. This is only a prototype, though. More sophisticated production models costing three grand are apparently already in the pipeline. All too soon, it was my turn to try and ride the wheel surf. Oh, my God. This is the least stable thing I've ever been on in my life, I think. As I wobbled around, desperately trying to balance the thing and not come a terrible cropper, I realised why Herman had been so insistent I wore a crash helmet. I'd be really lucky to come out of this unscathed. What you're fighting against is not, not necessarily going side to side that way, but also tipping backwards. So when you tip backwards, you naturally sh shut the throttle off slightly, which throws you forwards. So then you're, you're going into this kind of massive wobble where you're, where you're all over the place and you have to put your feet down. So it's really hard to get balance, maintain it and get your feet off. I think it's probably something that takes quite a while to get used to. I'd come all the way to Holland to ride this thing though and there was no way I was going to give up. So I tried again, again, again. I noticed that all the crew are running out of the way. <laughs> and again. And finally, I cracked it. The problem was that even when I could ride it, I couldn't quite see the point. It's very unstable and pretty slow. To be honest, I can think of better ways of spending three grand. Earlier on, we looked at passwords and how to make yours as secure as possible. But of course, that's not the end of computer security. As soon as you log on to the internet, there are a whole army of horrors just waiting to sneak onto your hard drive. Welcome to the nasty world of computer viruses. A computer virus is a usually malevolent little program that finds its way onto your computer without your permission. You can catch them by opening emails or attachments, by downloading infected programs or files, or increasingly these days, just by sitting there on the internet. And according to antivirus firm Symantec, Britain has a staggering 25% of the world's infected computers, more than any other country in the world. Viruses started as a laboratory game between computer boffins then became the preserve of youthful computer freaks who wanted to demonstrate their prowess by causing worldwide havoc. You may remember the love bug that sent emails to everyone in your address book. Or resume, a type of virus called a worm, which roams the net and seeks out weaknesses in your operating system. It was more of a nuisance than anything else, but increasingly viruses are being used by criminals for financial gain. Some of the virus programs they use, just like the ones we saw earlier gathering passwords, log all your keystrokes so they can get your financial details and steal all your money. John Worthington from Yorkshire lost £8,000 this year from just such a scam. Other programs can give someone else control over your computer by turning it into a zombie or bot. Networks of bots called botnets are then used by baddies to launch things like denial of service attacks. In these, they'll threaten, say, to crash a betting company's website the day before the Grand National. Unless the company pays the baddies a fat fee, they'll overwhelm the site with literally millions of fake requests from their thousands of bots. And your computer could be involved without you even knowing, except that it slows down a bit. 
And on sites like Kazar, you're likely to encounter so-called Trojan horses, malicious programs disguised as attractive downloads. You're actually not getting a free game or music track, but a program that enables someone else to control your computer. And the number of malicious viruses is expanding very rapidly. A few years ago, you'd be unlucky if you caught one. Now, if you're unprotected, you're likely to get caught very quickly. To prove it, we got computer security expert Dave Duke to connect a new computer to the internet without any protective software. So we connected this uh, Windows XP machine with a basic service pack onto the onto the internet, and this is a tool which allows us to analyse what happened. So yeah. uh, what what actually did happen? Okay, for the the first forty five minutes, not much, but uh, at for forty five minutes, we were hit by a, a worm that nobody had ever seen before. This is what we call a zero day exploit. Uh, none of the security products would have detected it as they tend to look for known threats. Uh, and what it did is it got into the system, it basically used all the resources, it, it slowed the machine down, it, it opened up 500 internet connections to, to spread itself out onto other systems in the network. And did it affect lots of files as well? There was over 36,000 files that were changed uh, by the worm when it hit the system. Um, obviously, again, slowing your system down, using all your resources. And what happened to the machine after 45 minutes? Was it, was the, it the still working, but more slowly? Or? It actually, the operating system failed. It just couldn't cope with the, the amount of uh, threats that it was trying to run at any one point in time. Uh, most hackers that write software, they're, they're not always brilliantly written, uh, and they tend to make systems fall over. And this particular one actually died. So if you were, if you'd bought this machine, put it on the internet, 45 minutes later it would be dead and you'd have to completely reinstall everything or take it back to the shop who would say... <laughs> they'd install it for you at a cost. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you do to protect yourself? Well, three main things and they're all available free of charge. The firewall included as standard with Windows just isn't good enough. Try Zone Alarm. It's free for personal use and it automatically stops most random, nasty intrusions. On a new computer, it's best to install the firewall first, off CD or USB memory, before you connect the computer to the internet. Then it can protect you against attack while you download the latest updates to your software. Most updates are expressly directed at known security flaws. Microsoft's update site should deal with your operating system and web browser if you're using Windows and Internet Explorer, for example. If you use other software like Firefox, check their sites for updates too. There are plenty of programs you can buy off the shelf, but I've been using Avast, which is free for home use. Antivirus software will typically protect against randomly circulating viruses, though it won't protect you against a determined hacker who wants to get control of your computer. For the time being, though, it's probably the best you can do. So if you want to avoid being an unwitting part of an international crime syndicate, get those firewalls, antivirus software and updates onto your computer now. Wiki? Wiki wiki? Wiki! The mammoth Rewarren is two metres long and weighs 80 kilograms, currently making it the 